Welcome, everybody. We are thrilled to have you here at the second in this wonderful series. And uh, we are, I think Lori is going to introduce, uh, introduce Asher. Go ahead, Lori. All right. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lori Black. I'm the Associate Director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience here at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of, of Music. Uh, this event is presented by the HUC JIR uh, Jewish Language Project and the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at UCLA, at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. Uh, it is co-sponsored by the Cantor's Assembly, the Sephardic Educational Center, uh, and Sephardic Studies UW Straum Center for Jewish Studies and the Los Angeles Hebrew High. To make sure that you know about all of the Lowell Milken Center's programming related to music of American Jewish experience, please make sure you're on our event's email list. You'll find the link to the mailing list in the chat below or simply Google UCLA Jewish Music and you'll, it'll be the first thing that pops up. We are very pleased to welcome you to the latest installment of Languages from Sephardic Seattle to Syrian Brooklyn uh, featuring Asher Shasha Levy. This is a very, very exciting program and it's always exciting for me to introduce a friend of mine, which makes it that much better. Um, Asher is uh, an amazing uh, artist uh, on the oud and singer and scholar of of this material and we are just so lucky to have him for this program uh, and we hope you will come to the next installment on july 13th part two of the shabbat program so make sure to mark your calendars now um and with that i'm very very excited to introduce this amazing artist asher thank you for joining us tonight thank you so much Lori. thank you sarah everyone at the uh jewish language project lowell milken center all of these wonderful institutions that are coming together to support this work. I really appreciate all of you. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here tonight and for joining as we continue this exploration of Jewish vernacular liturgy or really Jewish prayer uh, in many languages as represented in the Sephardic communities of the United States primarily. Um, last time we focused on the liturgy of Shavuot, the Ketubah de la Le, some of these poetic texts that speak of the marriage contract between God and the people Israel. Uh, and these pieces are special for that holiday. So today we're going to speak on, uh, on Shabbat texts, basically songs, prayers that were translated, and we're going to focus on the Judeo-Spanish communities today. Uh, next time, in the second part, we're going to speak on some uh, Judeo-Arabic pieces and texts and pismonim and whatnot, but today we're focusing mostly on uh, Judeo-Spanish, Judeo-Espanol. So Let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about this idea of prayer in many languages, prayer in local languages, vernacular liturgy or paraliturgy, however you refer to it. Well, in pretty much every Jewish community around the world that has um, a traditional liturgy, shall we say, there is a use of a vernacular language in the prayers, and that is Aramaic. So from an early stage, you had the use of languages that were not Lashon HaKodesh, the holy tongue, for prayer, for religious purposes. And this is actually attested in the Talmud. The Gemara says um, that you may recite, that there's a question, there's a machloket of whether one who recites the um, Keriyat Shema, the recitation of the Shema prayer, if one who recites it without hearing it fulfills his obligation. And so the Gemara clarifies, they say, what is the reason um, that one must recite the Shema in an audible manner? Because it is written Shema literally here, and Rabbi Yossi holds that this is to be understood literally, meaning that you must hear it. And they go further, they say that one may recite the Shema in any language that one can hear and understand, and specifically that there is no requirement to say the Shema in Hebrew. Um, in, in the text, Vetana Kama Sabar Shema Bechol Lashon Sheata Shema. That you that Shema, it's like to hear, so you can you can pray in any language that you hear. And so despite this early attestation of this practice, that you can say prayers in any language, we don't really begin to see this phenomenon of uh, vernacular prayers being published other than the Aramaic ones. Um, really until the, sort of the early modern period. So we have Yiddish vernacular 
uh, women's sidurim beginning in 1544, uh, Judeo-Italian sidurim in that vernacular starting in the 16th century. And that's the point where we start to see uh, Ladino sidurim being published primarily for women. There was one that was published in 1565 in Salonika that was a, a woman's sidur. So at that point, you start to see um, these translations. So I should clarify for a second, when I'm using Ladino today, what I'm referring to is not, um, not really Judeo-Espanol, um, the spoken form, which most people call Ladino. Um, I'm speaking about Ladino in a pretty limited sense of basically uh, calc literary direct translations of Hebrew into Judeo-Spanish. So things that would be basically word for word translations, even preserving certain syntactical phrases that might not make sense necessarily so much in Spanish, but were referential to the original Hebrew biblical texts. So Ladino, that word is from en ladinar, basically to make Latin like to this process of, of translating texts from Hebrew to Aramaic. And why was this necessary? Well, for, for a number of reasons. So we mentioned earlier women's sidurim and that um, there was a sense particularly in this period that women who were less religiously educated were often not taught Hebrew, but were st are still obligated in certain forms of prayer that they should have clear sidurim that reflected those needs. And so the two that we have from the 16th century in Ladino, one of them is dedicated towards yeah. use in the home, and the other one seems to be dedicated more for towards use in a synagogue setting. That's based on the instructions that are included there. Um, so this tent, there's, there was always a tension between a rabbinic desire to preserve the use of Hebrew, of Lashon HaKodesh in liturgical settings, as well as a feeling from the community that there needed to be these vernacular pra practices. Um, in the 17th century, we have a rabbi, Samuel Abouab, a Sephardic rabbi who was the, he was the leader of an Italian Sephardic community who writes in one of his She'elot Chubot, one of his responsa, that at that time in the 17th century, there were religious leaders, rabbis, hachamim, who were in the Ottoman Empire conducting prayer services in Judeo-Spanish, in these Ladino translations, primarily to accommodate the needs of many of the congregants who had been conversos. They had become new Christians forcibly. And when they found their way to established Sephardic communities, in many cases, they were not Jewishly literate. They could not read Hebrew characters. They had no knowledge of Jewish religious practices. So these Ladino texts, sometimes infrequently, they were printed in Latin characters until the 20th century, infrequently. But most of the time they were printed in Hebrew characters, either the block script or what we call the, the Rashi text, the sort of more handwritten text. And they were printed largely with vowels, which was not as common at the time, in order to allow for these people, these members of the communities who may have returned to Judaism, to participate. So you have the Ladino translation of the Shulchan Aruch, which was called the Mesa di Alma, the Rock of the Soul, um, first published in Salonika in 1568. And you have it published again in Venice a few times. Um, and this provides, these, these texts all build a vocabulary of this Ladino, of this translated Spanish. And this is even attested to from the uh, famous Rabbi Yaakov Kuli, who his work, the Me'amlo Ez, is one of the great works of Ladino biblical exegesis. And he says in seven, publishing in 1730 in Istanbul that many people do not understand the holy tongue. And even those who do know the words do not understand what they are saying. It sounds like something that's very familiar to us today. Many people just learn Hebrew to be able to read the liturgy, maybe for bar mitzvah or as part of a Hebrew school education, but don't understand the words. From day to day, there are fewer and fewer readers, and the law and the customs of Judaism are being forgotten. So it was basically from this situation, this um, sort of conflict between a desire to preserve prayer in Lashon HaKodesh, but also have people be able to participate and understand, that allowed for the innovation of liturgy in Judeo-Spanish 
in Ottoman communities. So let's explore a little bit of this liturgy um, and we'll continue exploring the history of this as we move along bit by bit. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna move through a few pieces that are very popular in different Judeo-Spanish communities for Shabbat. So I think I'm gonna start with a piece that is particular to a lineage of, um, okay, let's see here. Yeah, so the first thing that I'm gonna present from these, uh, from these liturgies is actually something slightly, slightly more modern in the sense that many of the pieces that I'm gonna be presenting today are old enough to not have a clear author. Um, some of these, some of these translations, these Ladino versions of some prayers, it's, there's no clear authorship. Where, whereas this version of Lechadodi um, was written by Rabbi Leon Behar. So Rabbi Leon Behar, Chacham Ye Leon Yehuda Behar, um, Turkish rabbi whose son was the senior Hazan of the Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel here in Los Angeles. Um, and he was born in Bulgaria, where his parents lived and where um, his father was a rabbi. And he was able to um, actually survive the Shoah and was a student um, in Israel and eventually moved to Mexico City, um, where he served as the head of a Turkish Sephardic okay. Hazan and had an extensive career um, as a Hazan and also as a musicologist, as someone who really uh, published works of research and uh, musical notes and, and things like that in order to preserve these pieces. So I'm going to begin with Lechado di Likrat Kala in Judeo-Spanish, in, in, actually in Ladino. This is a, a translation into Ladino by Rabbi Leon Yehuda Behar. And the melody that's used for this is one that is very familiar to many people from its application as part of the Yerushalmi Jerusalem Sephardic Kabbalat Shabbat. Reside el Shabbat con grande gloria. Va mi querido, encontra la novia. Reside el Shabbat con grande gloria. Guardar y acordar con comando uno modizo sentir él. Yo que es uno, a donde uno y su nombre uno. Por favor, hermosura y alabación. Encontra el Shabbat con grande afección, que es el manandero de la bendición. Te prohibió de antes de una tradición, mensa y la hora con grande atención. So the verses of the Lechad Odi would be moved through um, in the Judeo-Spanish, in the, in the Ladino, uh, which was, by the time that this was written um, in the, I'm not sure exactly when this was written, but it was probably written in the early 20th century, it was less controversial to have prayers done in Judeo-Spanish. That battle had already been fought for uh, a few hundred years, and there was a sense, I believe, among Ottoman Jews, Ottoman Jewish speakers of Judeo-Spanish, that the language that they were speaking was connected to 
certainly to their identity as Sephardic Jews, but rather than just being a form of Spanish that they had brought with them, it was something that was connected in a way towards Jewishness, that they're an expression of their Jewishness was the Spanish, the Spanish that had been um, basically developed in written form in order to teach the Torah and to translate pismonim and liturgical hymns. So uh, there was a sense that while this language, the the spoken form of it, Judeo-Espanol, whatever they called it, Judesmo, Judio, uh, El Espanol Muestro, all of these names for the spoken version um, had much to do with a sense of Jewishness. And in a city like Salonika, for instance, which was a heavily Jewish city in terms of trade, economics, uh, many non-Jewish members of the society, whether they Turk, Greek, Armenian, Bulgarian, Arab, had some facility in the Judeo-Spanish language because it was useful. And in fact, many Jews in the Ottoman Empire did not speak, say, Greek or Turkish or whatever that language was until the 20th century, until you see the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the Turkish state beginning to assume ascendancy. So let's move on. Let's move towards uh, something from the home ritual of Friday night. So last time we spoke a bit about Ribi Israel Najara, how Rabbi Najara, this incredible composer, is really the father of the various traditions that we have among Ottoman Sephardim of Pismonim, of these beautiful songs that are sung on Shabbat, that are sung on Hagim, that are sung throughout the year, um, that typically are religious and themed, but uh, starting with Najara, really, they were always set to Makamat. So the early texts that we have from Najara, you know, for Yari Bon Alam, which we're gonna hear in Ladino soon, or for any of these other famous pismonim, they, they, we don't necessarily know what the original melodies were, but he would associate them with a certain maqam, a scale. So a maqam in Arabic is the word for a musical modality, which also has a certain emotional pull. And among Ottoman Sephardic Jews, the use of the Arabic maqamat or the Turkish maqam lot is sort of the basis, the musical language that this prayer uh, and, and paraliturgy is, is sung in, basically. So I'd love to hear a couple different, to play for everyone a couple different versions before I sing the Istanbul melody of, uh, of Yari Bon Alam in Aramaic. I would love to play a couple of these historic recordings from members of the Ottoman Sephardic community. And you'll hear, you'll hear slight differences between the versions. So the first version we are going to hear is from Ankara, Turkey. Um, Yari Bonya, Senor del Mundo. De Ankara. Nos va a cantar unos cuantos piyotim en español. El primer es Yari Bonala. Lo cantábamos Noche Shabbat entre Pesach y Shabbat. Ya, Señor del mundo, de siempre y siempre. Ya, Señor del mundo, de siempre y siempre. Tú, el rey, el rey de los reyes. Tú, el rey, el rey de los reyes. Echas de tus varas. Beautiful. So we get a sense of this melody. Uh, we're going to hear the other melody uh, now from, or really not the other melody. It's the same melody. It's just a, a variant sung by Hazan from Istanbul. And all of these different versions, with one exception, which I've heard very few times, that has it, basically the same melody between these different Ottoman traditions, all in a maqam, a scale uh, called Husseini. Um, which is related to the Bayat family. Uh, so the scale would be...
with two microtones and a particular quality of this scale is that it focuses on the top half. So if you hear the melias in your little all above the fifth of the scale, which is one of the qualities that makes it Husseini. So now we're going to hear the same piece, Ya Señor del Mundo, but we're going to hear it from uh, from Razon, from Mordechai Razon and Yaakov Pardo from Istanbul. Ya Señor del Mundo, de siempre y siempre, tú el rey, el rey de los reyes, el rey de los reyes. Yo que te di es la honra y la grandeza. Yo que te di es la honra y la grandeza. Rígme a tus ovejas de boca de leones, de boca de leones. Beautiful. So you can hear some slight differences in the melody. to different makams. The lower part stays it's a little bit different. So now I'm going to sing a different variant. It's an Istanbul variant that I learned, but it's a little bit closer to what we heard as the Ankara melody, and it will finish with a verse in the Hebrew. So you'll be able to hear how this melody is also utilized for the original Hebrew text. Yeah. 
campo y amén de los cielos. Si vive el hombre miles de años, si vive el hombre miles de años, no puede recontar sus maraganías, no puede recontar sus maraganías. de ti es la honra y la grandeza yo que de ti es la honra y la grandeza rime a tus te voy a de leones rime a tus ovejas te voy a de little bit of Ya Señor del Mundo. So this is of a genre of, of pieces, of pismonim that would be sung typically at home around the Shabbat table. There are many, many, many dozens and hundreds of these pismonim, and not many of them, based on my research, I could be wrong here, but not many of them seem to still be sung in Judeo-Spanish in the United States. So when we're speaking mostly of the congregations that preserve Judeo-Spanish in the United States, uh, we're speaking of the, so, so it's, an interesting, it's an interesting situation. You have, when someone says, El Señor is a little too close to another religion. No, it's- Asher, you muted yourself. Ah, can I be heard now? Yes. Okay, great, 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 great. I see someone in the comments says, yeah, El Señor is a little too close to another religion. And I'd like to push back on that uh, before I move further, because many of these phrases are literal translations of the Hebrew into Old Spanish. That, that's what the Ladino literally is. So these phrases, um, Señor del Mundo, Patrón del Mundo, uh, various phrases are considered to be Jewish phrases among Ladino speakers, in the same way that phrases from Arabic, like, uh, like mashallah and alhamdulillah, have been incorporated into various Jewish languages, whether they be Ladino or Judeo-Arabics. Even, you know, in the Judeo-Arabic tradition, you have something that's similar to the difference between Ladino, the written language, and Judeo-Spanish, the spoken language. You have what's typically known as a, a sharah, which is a translation of a biblical text or prayers, literally a calc into Judeo-Arabic. And uh, in those phrases, you'll have translations that might seem a little bit strange to our sensibility, where we are very, we divide everything very strongly, that this is Jewish language, this is Christian language, this is Muslim language, etc. Whereas it would have been a, a bit more fluid in understanding and context, who was, who was speaking on it, who was using it was, would be would be critical, I would say, in that, in that context. But yes, you will notice phrases um, repeating, oftentimes uh, names for God, that that repeat. And and again, this 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 use of translations into Judeo Spanish is limited. I should I should mention that it is limited. So we're speaking of very few pieces, in particularly in in Shabbat. When you get to the Amim Noraim, High Holidays, the Silihot in particular, 
which hopefully you'll all join for the class that we have scheduled on that coming up in a few months as we get closer to that time of year. There's much more material there and there's more controversy. When it comes to Shabbat in Judeo-Spanish speaking communities, the most prominent pieces, so the ones we just did, um, Lecha Dodi, it's not a common practice anymore to have Lecha Dodi sung in Judeo-Spanish. I haven't heard a synagogue that still does it. Ya Señor del Mundo is sung still in homes, uh, I would say in Los Angeles and Seattle, places in New York, as well as the Ladino version of another pismon, which we're not going to touch on today, El Love Mi Ikshe. You, you'll see that done. And then in terms of the Shabbat morning service, it's basically the use of Judeo-Spanish of Ladino is limited to two spaces primarily. The Bendicho Su Nombre, which is the translation of the Berich Sheme de Mare Alma, that portion of the Zohar that we say before we take out the Sefer Torah for the procession. And the other piece is the Enke Loheno. So towards the end of the Musaf, we have the uh, we have the Enkelohenus. So we're gonna we're gonna look at those in a, in a moment. I think that let's start with uh, Berich Sheme. So uh, on Shabbat morning, when the Torah is taken out, the Berich Sheme de Mare Alma in many many Sephardic congregations is chanted in Ladino. Um, there are several congregations still in in America that use Ladino, I, I, I might add. Um, here in Los Angeles, Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel. In Seattle, there's Bikur Holim and Ezra Besarot. Um, in New York, there's a Sephardic Temple of Cedarhurst. There's the Jewish Center in Forest Hill, Queens. Uh, Congregation Orve Shalom in Atlanta. Um, Temple Moses, Sephardic Congregation of Florida and Miami. These various, these various communities mostly founded by Ottoman Jews from Island of Rhodes, Salonika, Izmir, Istanbul, places like that, to various degrees preserve this use. And the most notable pieces would be on a Shabbat, if you walked into one of these synagogues, would be the Berich Shemeh or the Enkelohenu. Enkelohenu in particular has become famous, and we'll speak about that in a little bit. So let's listen before I present um, an Istanbul via Los Angeles rendition of Berich Sheme, let's listen to a melody that is Salonican in origin and is also, I would say, probably the most well-known version of the Berich Sheme. So we're going to hear this version from 1979 by uh, Hazan from Salonika, uh, Shaul Moshe. Esto es la traducción del Berich Sheme de Mare Alma. Bendito su nombre del Señor del mundo, bendito su corona y su lugar, sea tu voluntad con tu pueblo Israel para siempre y resgata tu derecha. A mostrar tu pueblo en casa de tu santidad y para sonraer a nos de cuenta de tu claridad y por recibir muestras de filos con piadades. Sea voluntad delante de ti que beautiful. So you get a feeling for that uh, that particular rendition, which is in in the Bayat Maham. Those those notes. That's the Salonic conversion. So. The version that I'm going to present now is the version that I grew up hearing at Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel in Los Angeles uh, in a different maqam, um, in what might be called charga in, in Turkish or ajam in Arabic, basically just a major a major mode. Uh, and I'll, I'll do a little bit of this because you can hear, hear the, um, the distinction. Uh, 
yo su nombre del patrón del mundo Bien dicha tu corona y tu lugar Sea tu voluntad con tu pueblo Israel para siempre Y rescate con tu derecha Muestra a tu pueblo en casa de tu santidad para contraer a nos de bondad y claridad y recibir muestras oraciones con piedades. Sea voluntad de ti que alargues a nos vidas con bien. Por ser vosotros tus siervos, guardados entre los justos, por apiadarnos y por guardarnos a todo lo que a nos y lo que a tu pueblo Israel, tú sos quien mantienes a todos y gobiernas a todos, tú sos quien podesta sobre todo. Tú sos quien bodeza sobre los reyes, el reina es tuyo, y nosotros somos as esclavos del santo bendicho él, que nos encorvamos delante de él, y delante hora de su ley, en cada hora y hora. No sobrevaramos, engorbamos, no metemos nuestros confianza en ángelos de los cielos, salvo en el yo de los cielos, que es el Dios de verdad, su ley verdad, sus profetas verdad, que abunda por hacer bienes y verdades. En el nosotros creemos y a su nombre santo apreciamos. Vosotros decimos alabaciones, sea veluta delante de ti, que abras nuestros corazones en tu ley y cumplas demandas de nuestros corazones, corazón de tu pueblo Israel, por bien por vidas y por paz. Amen. So that's how I learned to sing the Spirit Shemeh. Uh, I have a question here. Am I making a distinction between Judeo-Spanish and Ladino? I'm attempting to. So I'm speaking of Ladino in reference to these pieces that I'm presenting. So Pismonim translated literally calced from Hebrew or Aramaic into Judeo-Spanish. That's Ladino. So translations of pieces from the Zohar, like Berich Shemeh, uh, or from the Torah, translations of Haggadah di Pesach, these, these sort of things, I would consider, and, and I think there's, a, in the scholarly community, there, there's a sense to try and distinguish the spoken from the written. Because the written, my understanding is that these texts were also used in North African communities that spoke Haketia. So there was a sense that there were different forms of the spoken language, but a, a wider usage of these, of these written texts. So as I mentioned, the Berik Shemeh and the Enkelohenu are the two main pieces that we see in Ladino for Shabbat in, in Sephardic Ottoman synagogues uh, in, in the United States today. And this tension that we feel between, or that was felt rather, hundreds of years ago between uh, these, these prayers in Judeo-Spanish, in, rather in Ladino, these Ladino prayers somehow being a, a compromise, somehow being something not as good as perhaps saying them in Hebrew, I think that that's fully disappeared in the wake of the diaspora of the Jews from the Ottoman, Ottoman lands around the world. And now these, these prayers, these vernacular liturgies are a link to that 
very important and rich past that in these communities, there's a lot of assimilation. There are a lot of people who who've moved away from the communities or, or did not have any Judeo Spanish spoken at home or whatever. So there's, there's a, there's a danger um, of the loss of these things. So I think that these things are preserved in these various synagogues as a means of connecting to, to that, to that important past. Um, I think it's important to pay attention to one of these older sources that we're, that we're looking at um, to see how even in the early 20th century, this was controversial. So we had this in the early 20th century, there was a, a, an editor of a paper called the Meseret, which was a very popular paper in Izmir in the early 20th century. And uh, August 24th, 1919, he publishes an op-ed criticizing a choir at the Giveret Synagogue, the La Signora Synagogue, um, for singing in Judesmo, what he's calling the, this Judeo-Spanish language. Um, and he says, if it, were, if it were so that we should be singing in our own language, Russian Jews would sing in Russian, Italian Jews into Italian, English Jews into English, et cetera. And what ended up happening is this person discussed the matter with the leaders of the congregation, the lay leaders, and understood that people needed this in order to be attracted to the synagogue, to understand, to have something that they felt was their own. And so what happened was they decided that the format would be the Hazan would chant the prayer in Hebrew, followed by the choir singing a translation in Spanish. And so this practice is reflected today in the very famous Enkeloenu that we have in, you know, um, here in Los Angeles, we have a version that's a little bit different from the one in Seattle. And it's also very different from the rarer variant from, uh, from Ceuta, I believe, or Tetuan in Morocco, from the Hakatiya speakers. So the first thing I'd like to play is that rarer version that is not really attested to in any American congregations, but is fascinating nonetheless. Um, it does speak to a certain Sephardic, shall we say, a world of Sephardic Jewry that spanned the Mediterranean. And so you have a version of Enkeloenu here in Chakatiya in Moroccan Judeo-Spanish that is very similar to the one that we see in Turkey and Greece. Lori, whenever you're ready with that first recording. No hay como nuestro Dios, no hay como nuestro Señor, no hay como nuestro Rey, no hay como nuestro Salvador. ¿Quién como nuestro Dios? ¿Quién como nuestro Señor? ¿Quién como nuestro Rey? ¿Quién como nuestro Salvador? Beautiful. And so now let's hear a little bit of Enkeloenu by Hazan Isaac Azos. Isaac Azuz, the famous Hazan, senior Hazan in, in Seattle, um, and a great resource on all things Sephardic and Ladino, the publisher of several wonderful uh, and beautiful Sidurim. So we're going to hear him sing Enkeloenu in Hebrew and Ladino. <laughs> Non como nuestro Dios, non como nuestro Señor, non como nuestro Rey, non como nuestro Salvador. Mi que lo que nu, mi que do nenu, mi que mal que nu, mi que moshi enu. Ken como nuestro Dios, ken como nuestro Señor. Ken como nuestro rey, ken como nuestro salvador. Beautiful. So you can hear how these melodies are very clearly related. The texts are very similar. Uh, and here is the version that I grew up singing here in Los Angeles at uh, Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel. And this is the version that has become popular, I think, around the country in largely progressive Jewish circles. And you'll hear that the Seattle version speeds up the Hebrew and is the same in the Ladino section as the Los Angeles. En que lo enu, en cadonenu, en que mal que nu, en que moshienu, 
no como vuestro Dios, no como vuestro Señor, no como vuestro Rey, no como vuestro Salvador. Mi que no eno, mi que adoneno, mi que mal que no, mi que moshi aeno, quien como vuestro Dios, quien como vuestro Señor, quien como vuestro Rey, quien como vuestro Salvador. No de le lo eno, no de la doneno, no de mal que no, no de le moshi aeno. Lo haremos a nuestro Dios, lo haremos a nuestro Señor, lo haremos a nuestro Rey, lo haremos a nuestro Salvador. Baruch Eloheinu, Baruch Adoneinu, Baruch Malkeinu, Baruch Moshiaenu. Bendito nuestro Dios, bendito nuestro Señor, bendito nuestro Rey, bendito nuestro Salvador. Atau Eloheinu, atau Adoneinu, atau Malkeinu, atau Moshiaenu. Tú sos nuestro Dios, tú sos nuestro Señor, tú sos nuestro Rey, tú sos nuestro Salvador. So that's the version of Enkeloeno that's sung here in Los Angeles. And with that, I think let's turn it over to a question and answer. Great. Well, Asher, thank you. This was amazing. It was just such a rich presentation, musically, linguistically, historically. And it's it's so interesting to think of these traditions as both coming from the Ottoman Empire, North Africa, and also being American Jewish traditions, because you know the Lowell Milken Center focuses on music in the American Jewish experience, and, and this is music in the American Jewish experience. Uh, so as you're thinking of questions to put in the Q&A, I just want to address one uh, point that was in there. And thank you all for your, your interesting comments in the Q&A, both from your own experiences with various Sephardic synagogues and music and, and other interesting tidbits. I want to address the issue of uh, the name of God in, in Ladino, which is Dio. And uh, in, in, in uh, non-Jewish Spanish, Dios, right? Dios. And so what is going on there? Well, yes, it does have to do with the singular plural thing, but I've learned that it's a little more complicated than that, that historically Dio was the name of God or Dio. And it became Dios in, I'm not sure what century, maybe the 12th century, something like that, when there was a, uh, an effort to Latinize Spanish. And so that's why you have um, Jesus, Right, it, it it ends up with the with certain case endings from Latin that didn't exist in Spanish before, and so Jews were uncomfortable with that shift because they saw it as uh, well. It, it could be that they were uncomfortable with it because they saw it as non monotheistic, or it could be that they were just speaking a more archaic version of Spanish that maintained that original word for God. Okay, a question about the recordings. Yes, um, the recording is going to be posted on the Facebook page of the Lowell Milken Center, and I am also going to um, post it on the Jewish Language Project events page, which I will put the link to right now in the chat. And Lori put the link to the Facebook page there. Um, okay, so other questions. And another thing about the distinction between Judeo-Spanish and Ladino, and, and Asher mentioned the name Judesmo, which was um, used sometimes in Ladino for the name of the language, means literally Judaism, but was name, a name for the language. Some people use the name Ladino to refer to the liturgical language, the calc translation language of Hebrew prayers into these Spanish words. Um, and other people use that as the name of the language more broadly. I think in, in some scholarly circles, you have that distinction between Ladino and Judesmo or Ladino and Judeo-Spanish. 
And it, but in most most people in popular discourse just use the word Ladino for for both of those ways of speaking. And I found a lot of Ladino speakers would speak of themselves as being Ladino speakers and don't necessarily preserve that distinction. That's more uh, more of a scholarly distinction at this point. Though I I, I must note that there are many Judeo Spanish speakers who I've had the privilege to know, who didn't call what they were speaking Ladino, they just called it Spanish. And so it would be in, in the language itself, they would either refer to it as just Spanish or our Spanish. So there was a lot of sense of the uh, muestro, everything muestro is referring to um, that which is, which is Jewish. So, you know, you'll have a lot of people saying uh, el, muestro, el, el Espanol Muestro or just Judeo Espanol. But in English context, some of those people would just say it's Spanish. It's our Spanish. Yeah. And uh, some people mentioned some helpful books in the chat. Uh, Jane mentioned the, uh, the book, The Jews of Ottoman Izmir by Dina Danon. Highly recommended, and uh, Cantor wonderful Neil, book. Neil Schwartz recommends uh, Flory Jagoda's songbook. Or do you pronounce it Jagoda or Yagoda? How do you say it? I've always said Jagoda, but I, okay. I can't. I can't know if that's correct. Yeah, I'm not sure. But and and Inke Lohenu was in that, and I do think she had a role in popularizing that song as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and and I'm glad you mentioned that it's part of the. Um, the prayer book, the Sidur of a lot of uh, progressive Jewish congregations in America now. Right, I've noticed that the new conservative movement Sidur has included it, which is, yeah. but it's also, we can learn a lot from that because they've included the Los Angeles version. So the version that got popularized was the Los Angeles version, which is, it's again, it's they're all 90 something percent the same, but the Los Angeles version is the one that has the same tempo for the Hebrew and the Ladino, and there's one linguistic difference, which is in the last verse for Atahu Elohenu in Los Angeles, it's it's tu sos muestro dio. In Seattle, it's tu el muestro dio. Yeah, so, and also I noticed in Seattle they said Ken, in, and in in the Los Angeles they said Ken. Right. So there are just these little differences that are yeah. um, they're definitely worth paying a lot of attention to because they can tell you so much as to how these things became part of the liturgy where they came from, you know, whether it's Istanbul or Izmir or Rhodes or, or whatever it may be. Yeah, Cantor Neil, do you have a question? Wait, you're muted. Sorry, I'm gonna lower my hand there. Okay, um, I don't know whether or not it is well known in the coasts, but there is a Sephardic service that meets in Minneapolis once a month. And they do something very, very different. They attract Sephardim, um, mostly Mizrahim, from the entire, um, from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to, I suspect, Bukhara. And they take turns leading parts of the service. And it's like listening to United Nations of Judaism to hear how they are pronouncing the Hebrew, how they are uh, using the Makamat and um, I didn't understand with the JTS education just how vastly different Yemenite pronunciation of Hebrew is from even Sephardit, much less uh, uh, other versions of Hebrew. But um, what's interesting is that, Asher, you have been showing us musical differentiations among communities. What I experienced during two years trying to get to that service as often as I could um, because it was only held once a month and I lived all the way across the town in St. Paul, um, that they simply each did their own thing and in a very friendly, gentlemanly manner passed it around. So like in the course of one Torah chanting uh, with seven aliyot, one would be a Moroccan, one would be a Yemenite, one would be, uh, I don't know, a Saloniki and you would hear seven completely different styles of Sephardi trope. So I just wanted to lay that out there, that that is something that is going on in an unexpected corner of North America. That's wonderful. You know, you mentioned uh, Yemenite pronunciation. 
I think it's more accurate to say that there are multiple Yemenite pronunciations and that oftentimes in yeah. each community in Yemen, yeah. you know, you have a distinction. How do you treat the letter Gimel? So in, I, I'm not at all a scholar of Yemenite Judaism, but I'm aware that one community treats it. Um, well, there, there are multiple different sounds that are assigned to Gimel throughout Yemen with Dagesh and without Dagesh. In different places, Gimel is treated like, like um, Gha, or ja, but in some places it's a regular, it, it, it's a regular, it's it's a very it's a very different thing. And I know in some dialects that the kof sound is actually a gof, more like what we would think of as a gimel. So there are so many different distinctions, you know, but at the same time, it's important to sort of understand how these sort of families of tradition operate in the sense that the ta'amea mikra, the Torah reading trope that you find um, in the Levant is basically the same from Egypt through the Balkans. And even in some parts of Iraq, you have this same ta'amea mikra that's based on, um, on makam siga. So, mm, so siga, it's, a, it's a quarter flat. So it depends on where you're where you are in the Middle East, how it's going to be treated. So it's almost more like a third degree of the scale in Turkey. That's sort of the way the Turkish way would do it, whereas in Arabic, you would have be more on the half. Line. So there's so many distinctions musically, linguistically all of these things between the different communities that Sephardic in a sense, I think this might be a good closing thought unless anyone has any other questions. Sephardic is maybe best thought of in a couple of different contexts. So we have Sephardim who descend from people who were expelled from Spain and have that direct Spanish connection. But then you also have all of these different communities that are somehow associated with the Sephardi ethos. Um, whether it's a nosah tefillah, whether it's a certain form of religious observance of halakha that is prominent from, you know, Bukhara in the East all the way to the Western Sephardim in Western Europe. So it's, it's both, it's both that, that Jews from Spain, but also a wider sort of uh, net of interrelated communities that shared various things, but also had many, many crucial distinctions. Okay, well, we are out of time. So Asher, can you just give us a quick uh, teaser of next time? Just let us know, will we get to hear some uh, other languages? Yes, yeah, so next you? time, next time, because this time was focusing fully on Shabbat paraliturgy from the Judeo-Spanish tradition, next time is going to be not Judeo-Spanish. So for the, mo the pri it's primarily gonna be Judeo-Arabic and different Judeo-Arabics. Um, and you'll you'll notice that in many of those communities, there's even less of a focus on having translated liturgies. In those communities, the services, for the most part, are in Hebrew. So we have to search a little bit to find these vernacular liturgies, and we'll find them around the Shabbat table. We'll find them especially for Havdalah. So if you're interested in this, please come. <laughs> Okay, great. And uh, if you're interested, uh, the Jewish Language Project also has some other events coming up. We're going to, these aren't announced yet, but if you sign up for our mailing list, which I put in the chat, uh, it's, it's on the Jewish Language website under contact, you'll um, get an email about uh, the Baghdadi Jewish diaspora and the language practices there in India and other places, and also a talk about endangered Jewish languages and how Jews speak all around the world. So thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you in the other events of this series and hopefully other events by the Lowell Milken Center and the Jewish Language Project and all the other sponsoring organizations.